Добре дошли отново. Време е за следващата ни лекция. Тя отново е свързана с, с ДНК, но този път ще погледне малко по-назад в миналото и ще си говори малко за происхода на човека. И затова наш, как нашето ДНК може да демонстрира към кое семейство реално сме принадлежали. И да открием много и нови интересни неща за нашия собствен происход. Нашият лектор днес се казва Джонатан Петит. Той и преди е бил гост на Рацио в качеството си на генетик. Той в момента работи в университета в Абърдин. Моля ви да посрещнете с аплодисменти. Доктор Джонатан Петит. Okay, so um, for the next half an hour or so, I'm going to be taking you through on the tour of this sort of complex messiness of human genetics. And, and people are becoming more and more interested in, in sort of their own genetics, human genetics, I assume, um, and, and getting their genetic profiles made. So this, this growth of interest in genetics is, is great for people that do genetics, because uh, they get to do things like this. Um, unfortunately, the genetics I do is worm genetics. So, but then, from my perspective, humans are just slightly larger worms. So it, it, it's all effectively the same. And so I've been teaching and researching genetics for, uh, gosh, nearly three decades now. Um, and one of the things that I've always found to do before I start my teaching each year, I'll just Google terms that are in the news associated with genetics. And it's interesting to see how things have changed, the perception of, of genetics has changed uh, so through, through the years. So in the mid-2000s, if you Google genetics, you get things like this. So this was a DNA test. I think this was, as I say, the mid-2000s. For only $99, they would test for one gene. Um, but it's an important gene. This is the warrior gene. So this is whether you can be a stern man, an American footballer, or possibly a Viking. Um, I could do a whole lecture just on this one gene um, and the nonsense associated with it. And this is a more recent test. The DNA Warrior Team Test is keep, get, keeps going, so there's clearly still money in it. Um, but over the years, things sort of took, took a more whimsical turn. So when I typed in search terms for genes, sometimes I get really odd things. One year, for instance, the top hit was Liam Gallagher's son. Liam Gallagher from Oasis. His son's called Gene. <laughs> And he looks like Liam Gallagher, so there's genetics there. So that was, that's quite good. Um, Then another, another year, the search term for Gene was this calf that looks like, looks, looks like Gene Sillum, Simmons from KISS. So, I mean, it does look like Gene Simmons, so that's quite good as well. Although, I think that's not genetics that we're looking at there. Um, but more recently, things have taken a more sinister turn. Um, now, genetics has always had something of an image problem. The first professor of genetics at UCL in London Uh, was actually the professor of eugenics. Um, and the 20th century was not kind in terms of the optics for genetics. But more recently, this sort of, this sort of view of genetics, the idea of, of genetics and white supremacy and so forth, is increasingly coming up in our search terms. And I think that's connected to the idea of the long-standing idea that racism is connected to the idea of blood and inheritance. And instead of blood, we now use gene. Does anybody know or anybody want to guess? Or maybe they know the quote. Whose quote this is? Oh, yes, very good. Yeah, Donald Trump. Pr pr proud of his German blood. Um, Trump's a bit of an easy target, though, isn't it? I mean. One of the more disturbing trends, though, has been this sort of thing. So this is Nicholas Wade. Nicholas Wade was the former New York Times science correspondent. And in 2014, he published a book called A Troublesome Inheritance, Genes, Race, and Human History. And in the book, he postulated that population genetics, so population genetics is the science of 
genetic change through time and through geography. He postulated that the discoveries in human population genetics supported all sorts of ideas that humans have, have evolved, different human populations have evolved to be good at different things. So one of the things he proposed was that the Ashkenazi Jewish population were particularly good at capitalism. <laughs> yes, seriously. Now, you, you couldn't make this stuff up. But actually, as Nicholas proved, you, you can make it up, because that's effectively what he's doing. Um, what was interesting is the population genetics community internationally got together in response to this and paid for an advertisement in the New York Times. Um, and it's pretty damning. Um, they call his incomplete and accurate account, and uh, obviously this word here, guesswork. What I really liked, or would rather didn't like, was Nicholas, Nicholas Wade's response to this, which was, well, they would say that, wouldn't they? Because they're at universities and they're all Marxist left-wing liberals. So what I want to do is take you on a tour, if you like, and question this, this, these sort of assertions. How different actually are people? Okay? Can we identify specific groups? how different, for instance, are the races, and do races even exist? So this guy here, uh, this is Blumenbach, on, on there on the right. And Blumenbach was the first person to properly codify the, what we, we recognize as, as racial groups today. Interestingly enough, Blumenbach himself, you would probably, he was quite forward-thinking, even though he was the person that put forward these. He was actually a, a, a very forward-thinking person at his time. So I think he'd be appalled at the way his classification has been used. So what I want to do in this talk, then, is look at this, these classifications and say, how well is the, are these supported by genetics? Spoiler, they're not. Okay. Now, that's not to deny that there are differences that are associated with certain populations, okay? Earwax is a really good one. Um, if looking, looking at the faces here, uh, not being racist by saying looking at the faces here, most of you have wet, uh, have wet smelly earwax, okay? Um, dry, flaky earwax is at a higher frequency in East Asian populations, okay? But at a higher frequency. It doesn't mean to say that everybody has it. And it doesn't, it, it mixes quite freely across the planet. Okay, so I'm not denying that there are genetic differences between certain groups. What I am going to say is that those differences are not as profound as you might believe. The first thing we need to do is work out what your genetic code really is, okay, or what it's actually doing. And the, th the first surprising thing I want to cover is that about 10 to 15 percent of your genome. Is the, only, is, is the bit that's doing stuff. Most of your genome is not doing anything. Okay, and then when I say not doing anything, it's not doing anything that you would care about in terms of it's not doing anything for you. Okay, um, and so this is where I want to sort of use a, a metaphor. So the metaphor that's often used for the human genome is it's like a book. And, and in fact, you can see displays in museums where they've printed out the human genome in a whole series of books. But I don't think that captures really, because most books, you want to read all of the book, okay? So realistically, the human genome is actually much more like a fashion magazine. Most of the bits in it you don't really care about. Those are the ads and the perfume sachets and so forth. And they're not, they're not necessarily salient to the bits that you want to read. The bits that you want to read, there's only a small fraction uh, of, of your fashion magazine genome. But actually, even that's not accurate, because for it to be properly your genome, your, it would have to consist of 23 copies of the Vogue magazine that you got from your mum, 23 copies of, of, of Vogue magazines that you got from your dad, plus a special mini supplement that only your mum gives you. That's your mitochondrial DNA. But even that isn't accurate, because what they will have their own 46 copies of Vogue that they got from their parents. And in order to give them to you, what they have to do is tear their copies up and rejoin them and glue them back together and cut bits out and rejoin those and glue them back together before they pass them on to you. And in doing so, they're probably going to make mistakes. But remember, that doesn't matter so much because most of what they give you isn't doing anything. Okay, so some of you might, for instance, get moisturizing tips that are you know, slightly odd compared to everybody else's. Um, 
Some of you might have a more positive review of whatever misogynistic crap Johnny Depp's doing this month compared to everybody else. Some of you will get hydration tips that are more positive than others. Some of you will be missing the Hugo Boss perfume. The point is, in most cases, the, dif the differences that we have between us are not matter they don't matter very much. Okay? So the genetic differences that we see from one person to another doesn't really matter. I can see looking at your faces like, enough with the vogue, okay, we get it. <laughs> but people remember metaphors. So this is your genome, okay, this is what it sort of looks like. It's a chromosome squash, just to, to reiterate that I am actually talking about physical things. I don't really believe that you're inheriting fashion magazines from your parents. So, but the key thing about all of this is that you're a mosaic. Okay? You're a mosaic because your genome was created by your parents as a mosaic. Theirs was too. You, if you have children, will pass on your genome as a mosaic going forwards and going back. And that mosaicism then, that's, that mixing and matching is an important thing when we're thinking about heredity. So I want to just spend a few minutes on that. So when you're, uh, if we just focus on one particular chromosome, you get a pair of chromosomes from, uh, your mum gets a pair of chromosomes, one from her dad and one from her mum. I'm just showing one, one chromosome here. And what will happen, largely randomly, is that she'll pass one of these chromosomes on to you, and it can either be passed intact, or it can be a mixture, a synthesis of both your grandpa and your grandma's chromosomes. Okay. Um, and that's the mixing and matching that I'm talking about. So this is a figure taken from Graham Coop uh, at the University of San Diego. He specializes in these wonderful diagrams, so um, I have no qualms about stealing them. And what he's done here, he's extrapolated a simulation of what your genome would look like going backwards, potentially, into a mother. So this is a simulated genome, and the shaded bits are your genome. And you can go back another generation and to extrapolate your genome into your maternal grandma in this particular case. So if we home in on one particular chromosome, you see in this simulation your, your mum passed an intact chromosome, chromosome 16, onto you. Um, so that's an example of an intact. But you'll note that you have not received any of chromosome 16 from your maternal grandma. If you look at chromosome 22, you see uh, again your mother's passed one of those copies onto you. This time it was the maternal, your, the grandma, your grandma's genome was passed on to you. But you look, if you look back at your genome in your maternal grandma, you'll see when she passed it on to your mum, that, that got mixed up. That was a mixed and matched genome. So this is an important feature then. As you go back in time, your genome explodes. Okay? On average, your parents make about 71 splices. Okay, so your genome going back into your parents fragments in about, into about 118 pieces, into your grandparents into about 189 pieces on average. So going back in time, as you can see, as you go back in time, you go, your genome gets exploded into more and more pieces and into more and more people. But you'll notice one important feature is as you go back in time, there are fewer and fewer people that are your genetic ancestors. They're your genealogical ancestors. So if you look at 600 years ago, um, only about 3% of, of your genuine ancestors have actually given you any genetic material. Okay? So that's, that's an important fact. And this explosion, as you go back in time, also creates some unusual features of the pedigree. So this is again uh, taken from Graham Coop. This is a simulated pedigree going backwards in time, starting from the individual at the bottom, generation zero, and going back. And the circles, when they appear, they represent individuals in your pedigree that appear more than once. Okay? So you can see in this simulated pedigree, we start encountering, we see six individuals that appear at generation 10. So, that means that there's several routes now to each one of these ancestors in your, in your pedigree. This, this is inbreeding, okay? And it's the definition of pedigree collapse. You can also superimpose another person on this. 
And now the circles are not saying um, individuals that appear more than once in the pedigree. They're saying individuals that appear in both pedigrees. So the blue person and the red person at the bottom. When that first circle appears in generation nine, that's the first common ancestor of both of those individuals. So that's a simulated pedigree, but what about real data? So you get some rem quite remarkable things. So one of the consequences of pedigree collapse, pedigree collapse occurs because you are literally running out of ancestors. Okay? So you, each time you go back in time, in generations, you're, you're, you're doubling the number of ancestors you have, but eventually you reach a point when you're starting to run out of ancestors. There simply aren't enough people in the world. Okay? If you're European, okay, by the 13th century, you have a common ancestor that you share with me. So everybody who's a European here, there is a single person that they will share as a common ancestor with me. Okay? Now, there are other common ancestors that you'll share with other people that you might be geographically more close to. But that's quite striking. You haven't gone far, back far, very much and you, to, to a guaranteed common ancestor of nearly everybody in this room. By the 10th century, it gets even freakier. By the 10th century, everybody who is alive, if they've had descendants, is the ancestor of everybody in Europe. Okay? They're my ancestor, they're your ancestors. All of them. So, in other words, everybody alive then is your ancestor, if you have significant European ancestry. Which is why I've highlighted this guy here. This is Abd al-Rahman III. He was the Caliph of Cordoba. And he's my ancestor. If you're European, he's your ancestor. I guarantee it. Population genetics guarantees this. And Graham Coop's laboratory uh, showed in this paper very clearly, showed genetically and pr proved that that was the case. Back in the 10th century, everybody who was alive then is the ancestor of everybody alive today in Europe. Okay? Now, you can get even more edifying results if you look at population simulations. So this is a population simulation carried out by a, a group of researchers. It's been subsequently uh, verified by various other researchers that come to the same conclusion. And that is the common ancestor of everybody alive today lived startlingly recently, between two and 5,000 years ago, depending on the conditions of the simulation. 5,000 was the most unrealistic thing they could come up with. They made it as conservative as possible. And what they were doing was model modeling the population flow based on as, as much as they could, real evidence from people that were alive about 2,000 or 5,000 years ago. So, and you get an even more startling result when you say, well, how long before we get to the point where in the 10th century, everybody alive in Europe is the ancestor of everybody alive today? About 6,000 years. 6,000 years ago, everybody that was alive in the world, or almost everybody, because you know we don't want to say it definitively. 6,000 years ago, everybody who was alive in the world, if they left descendants, they're the ancestor of everybody alive in the world today. Just think about that. So, people discovering the ability to uh, cultivate rice in the Yangtze River. They're your ancestor, definitively. Okay. So these are genealogical ancestors, though, right? So, and, and so sometimes when you give the, I give this talk, they say, "Yeah, that's genealogical ancestors." They haven't given me any genes. Where, what about my genes? I want to know where my genes have come from. Okay, we'll do that then. So remember the, the little mini supplement that your mum gives you. That's your mitochondrial DNA. That mitochondrial DNA, we can trace that back. So we can build pedigrees going back to the, the mitochondrial DNA that was generated and given to everybody alive today. So we build these sorts, of, these sorts of trees going back in time. And we can go back to what's called the mitochondrial Eve. Mitochondrial Eve lived about 200,000 years ago. 200,000 years ago, everybody was in Africa. All Homo sapiens was in Africa. So your mitochondria traces its origin back to ancestry in Africa. But what about the rest of your genome? Well, the rest of your genome is quite complicated, but also there's some rather counterintuitive things that come about when we start looking at individual human genomes. So we can take an individual person 
And we can, and remember, you get one chromosome from your mother for every chromosome. You, so every segment of DNA that you get from your mother, you get an equivalent segment from your father, apart from the X and the Y chromosomes. So we can compare those, and we can say, in this segment there on the left, for instance, you can see that there's a, a region where there's only a few changes in the DNA letters. And on the right, there are many more changes in the DNA letters. So we can, we can use that information to extrapolate back. And one thing I want to then emphasize is what we're doing here is we're taking an individual person and we're unraveling the entire record of human ancestry. Okay? We're going all the way back beyond Homo sapiens to when those pieces of DNA were identical. So we're looking uh, backwards in time in your pedigree into humanity, okay? You truly contain legions. So, for instance, how do we do that? So, if we take those two segments, what we can do is we can um, extrapolate them back and say, well, when would they have been the same? So, for some segments, we'll find that it's about, say, 50,000 years ago. Well, 50,000 years ago, it's just possible that the, ant the person carrying that segment of DNA, that they might not have lived in sub-Saharan Africa then because by 60,000 years, human, humanity was starting to migrate out of Africa. But if we go back and look at another segment, which has more changes comparing your mother to your father, you find you can go back a million. We can go back up to about five million years. At five million years, the whole genome goes dark. Okay? There are no longer any differences that we can use at that point. Okay? So the oldest part of any genome is about five million years. Everything that I've just told you applies to anybody on Earth, no matter where they live. Okay? So that's where, we, that's where human genetic diversity lives. It lives inside you. The most diversity that you see comparing people alive today is comparing individuals. Okay? That's where the, the majority of the diversity lives. So... Where, when we do this analysis, what do we get for, in terms of where, where the, or the, the, the age of most segments of DNA? The age of most segments of DNA is about 100,000 years. 100,000 years ago, the only Homo sapiens around lived in Africa. So the ancestry of most of your genome, remember, this is comparing your mother to your father and saying, when do most segments that I got that co coincide, when do they reach a common ancestor? about 100,000 years ago. So your common ancestor, and that's true regardless of where you're in the world, truly your common ancestor of most parts of your genome was somebody living in sub-Saharan Africa about 100,000 years ago. Different ancestors for different segments and at different ages. But I say most, not all. Some parts of your DNA didn't come from those individuals. Some parts of those DNA came from these guys. So this is a reconstruction there on the right of a Neanderthal. We can do that because we have lots of skeletal remains of Neanderthals. Those sorry fragments there on the left are another uh, ancient uh, homonym called the Denisovans, and we only have scraps of, of, of fossil evidence for them, but we have genome sequences for them. So I think, I think this is the most magical discovery in human genetics. Analyzing a fragment of bone that we thought, well, it was, this is probably Neanderthal, it could be Homo sapiens. Let's extract the DNA and sequence it. It's a completely new hominin that nobody's seen before. Okay. So the Denisovans and the Neanderthals, I'm sure it's fairly well known. Some of you will have done 23andMe and you've got back your results. And I guarantee your results will say, again, if you're European, it will say between, somewhere between 1% and 2%. Some of you will have lower levels. None of you will have higher than 2%. If you do, 23andMe is, is either telling you a lie or if, if it's real, come and see me because we need to do something with your ancestry there. The Denisovans, the story is slightly different. The Denisovans DNA is primarily in individuals from East Asia. Okay? Um, and at peaking at high levels at 
in, in individuals from New Guinea with New Guinean ancestry. So individuals with New Guinean ancestry have up to 8% of their DNA is non-homo sapiens. Okay, it comes from Denisovans and Neanderthals. And obviously, we all know why this has happened, because humans that migrated out of Africa about 60,000 years ago, like most tourists, had sex on their mind. And so they had sex with the people that they encountered, and the people they encountered were the Neanderthals and the Denisovans, who had actually migrated out hundreds of thousands of years earlier. So again, you can ask, well, that's kind of cute, but so what? Well, the so what is, is the medical stories, okay? So what have the Neanderthals, for instance, given to you? Well, lots of things. Uh, we've got inherited some uh, different types of protein for hair and skin. We've inherited disposition, predispositions to things like Crohn's disease or uh, type 2 diabetes. So they've given us some fairly bad things, too. This is my favorite one. This is a reconstruction, again, by Kenneth and Kenneth. This is from the Natural History Museum. So this is a Neanderthal at the front, and at the back there is an individual. Uh, that's a Homo sapiens. That's uh, a, a, an, an individual um, reconstructed from a skeleton of about 50,000 years old. It looks like this, he's smoking, which I think is cool, but actually that's just an out-of-focus out of uh, strand of grass. It's just sucking on a grass stem. But I like this picture because actually one of the things that the Neanderthals have given us, or some of us, is the difficulty in giving up smoking. <laughs> so what about the Denisovans? I think the Denisovan story is actually more stunning. And this is really, truly stunning. Um, so if you live in Tibet, you're living at high altitude, you're living at very low levels of oxygen, and that has consequences. If we took uh, any of you guys up to living at that high altitude, what would happen is that you would make more blood cells. That's why athletes go and train at high altitude. That's good in some respects, but it's actually bad because your blood pressure would rise. And as your blood pressure rises, one of the, things that, one of the consequences of that is it becomes hard to maintain a pregnancy, okay? Because that, sort of, that sort of high level of blood pressure damages placenta. So, What's happened is the individuals living in Tibet, living at high altitude, have become acclimatized to that. In fact, they've adapted genetically to that. And they've adapted genetically by not having that response. They don't make more blood, red blood cells in response to low oxygen tensions. They have other physiological responses to that. But one of their abilities to prevent that from happening turns out to be a gene called EPAS1. The variant of that gene, everybody has EPAS1, but the variant of that gene that, the, that um, the Tibetans have came from a Denisovan. It's, it's non-homo sapiens DNA. Okay? Presumably, the Denisovans had already solved the problem, evolutionarily speaking, of living at high altitude, and then we come along, have sex with them, and say, well, this is a bonus. There are some oddities as well. The Denisovans have given certain individuals, so at least Asian individuals, uh, they, they have uh, molars with three roots. It's kind of rare in most populations, um, it's, but it's uh, elevated levels uh, in, in, for instance, Han Chinese populations and also uh, native North Americans and South Americans. Again, evidence suggests that it's Denisovan DNA, which has done that. So, this is a feature, then, of human populations that we need to, I want to bring and magnify up for the rest of the lecture. Migration, migration because we migrate out of Africa, and mixing. In this case, mixing with a, a group of, of individuals that we would possibly call a separate species. Though, obviously, we have to... Te there's, there's, that's a debatable point because we were able, clearly able to uh, produce fertile offspring with these individuals. But mixing and migration are the major story of human ancestry. Okay? I'm going to give you an example for human ancestry in Europeans. Okay? Another European story. We are in Europe, after all. So this guy here, this is Cheddar Man. Another reconstruction. This is Cheddar Man reconstructed from a skeleton found in Cheddar Gorge, Ch Cheddar Gorge in England. Um, he lived about 14,000 years ago. He is an example of a, what we call the Western hunter-gatherer. Okay? So he's one of many, many skeletons whose genomes were sequenced. And in doing so, we can then plot an idea of, of what happened, where do we come from. So any notion 
that we might have, so for instance, Trump's idea about German blood, that's, not a, that's a fairly ephemeral thing to be talking about, okay? Because European, uh, European ancestry is not pure. It's a mixture. This guy here has contributed some of it, not very much, the Western hunter-gatherers. The other major population that contributed to us were these early European farmers. These are a group that uh, migrated out of, uh, initially out of the Fertile Crescent, but via Anatolia. Um, they migrated in, mainly displaced the Western hunter-gatherers, but also there was some, uh, in, some uh, mixture with them as well. And then about 5,000 years ago, another group appears, the Yamnaya. These are a group that existed north of the Black and the Caspian Sea on the Pontic Steppe. And they came in and really shook everything up. It's thought that they brought the wheel. They may have brought Indo-European languages with them as well. Europeans are a mixture of these three principal populations. The key thing that I want to emphasize, though, is that these populations are gone. They no longer exist in unmixed form, okay? We're their inheritors. But if you were a human population geneticist around at the time and you were able to compare the genomes of these, well, we can do it now, but if you would if you'd go back and see them, they would look as different as Europeans and East Asians do today. So these are distinct populations that look different from any other population that on Earth that has been or, or, or will be, and they're gone because they're present in an unmixed form. So the words racial and purity really don't have any genetic meaning. And I could tell the same story about anyone on Earth, no matter where you come from. You come from populations that mixed like this. So here's some simulations of this population. So about 10,000 years ago, it'll run multiple times so you can choose to which panel you want to look at. So the Western hunter-gatherers dominated Europe. Uh, so the scale bar represents uh, the percentage of, of genomes in those individuals. So we've got 100% at about 10,000 years ago, Western hunter-gatherer. They get gradually displaced by the early European farmers. As the Bronze Age starts to begin, the Yamnayans come in, um, bringing their particular uh, sets of genetic ancestry. So you can see this is really dynamic. That's how we need to be viewing human ancestry. It's dynamic. Populations change very rapidly over, over, over relatively short periods of time, as we'll see in a minute. So this is obviously prehistorical time, but we can see change in history. And we can see some of the evidence. So for instance, if you look in the center panel, if you look in um, Sardinia, you can see the Sardinian region has, is slightly more pink. And that's because Sardinians have slightly more early European uh, farmer uh, contributions than other areas do. They, they seem to have been protected, relatively speaking, from the Yamnaya as they, as they invaded. So this is the thing. We're all admixed, and we always have been, and we probably, from now on, certainly, with air travel, we always will be. That doesn't stop this kind of shenanigans, though. So this is, a, a, this is a still from a film that was taken uh, of white supremacists chugging milk in New York City. As you can see, topless. What you can't see from this is shouting at the camera saying, if you can't drink milk, you should go home. <laughs> what? <laughs> What's happening here? is what's kind of always happened, and that is racists misappropriating biology or genetics to support their own particular prejudices. Okay. Now, I'm not saying by educating racists that we'll deal with racism, because that's not necessarily coming, as I think should be evident from necessarily from genetics, but it's genetics is being used as an excuse. And just as a side, any of you thinking about using biology to support any of your prejudices, just be careful, okay? Um, so, Finding Nemo is a great example of you have, to, you have to be very careful about how you use biology to tell your stories, okay? So, at the beginning of Finding Nemo, of course, um, F Nemo's family is wiped out, leaving just him and his dad. Well, they're both clownfish, so under those circumstances, Nemo's dad would have become a female 
and have fucked his son. <laughs> That's what they do. So, cautionary tale there. And the same is true of these white supremacists. Basically, what they were doing is misusing genetic stories. So this is a map. I'm sorry if I've spoiled Finding Nemo. I feel, I feel like you might turn on me. Um, so this is a map of drink, being able to drink milk as an adult um, across the planet. And as you can see, Northern Europe, the, where the white supremacist favorite region, um, does have a very high level of individuals that as adults can drink milk without any adverse effects. But as I think you can also see, yeah, it's, it's not just Northern Europe. And in fact, regions of the world that those white supremacists probably would be less happy about saying they share biological properties with. The truth is that being able to drink milk has arisen at least five times in human history, uh, human, well, human prehistory. Okay? So this is, this is not something that's confined to one particular group, but it is slightly more complicated than, than it would at first be apparent. So being able to drink milk is critical if you're a mammal, okay? because that's how you survive at the beginning. But about five years for humans, the gene that's required, okay, it's a gene that makes an enzyme called lactase. You need lactase to digest the sugar in milk, which is lactose. Okay? Um, but after your, about five years, traditionally, you wouldn't need that gene anymore, so it switches off. Okay? But in certain individuals that carry mutations, so the arrows point to the different individuals that carry different mutations, they have single changes to the DNA letters, which mean that the gene stays on okay, into adulthood. That means that you can drink milk without any adverse consequences. And as you can see here, there's individuals from Kenya and Tanzania, Bedouins, Somalians, and Europeans. All can do that, but they do it for different reasons. Okay? The DNA changes are slightly different. They all have the consequence that the gene stays on, but they have uh, the ability to drink milk evolved at different times in those groups. They're obviously, it's all associated with pastoralism. You have to have an animal to milk in order to, for this selection to work. And this is where, this is, I think this, this is my favorite bit of the story. This would really infuriate the white supremacists. Because at least they could say, yeah, 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 I know, but that single base pair, that's mine. That's white, that base pair. Yeah, no. <laughs> These are the Fulani. So the Fulani are a successful pastoralist group that spread throughout sub-Saharan Africa. Recently, we, we knew they were able to drink milk as adults, and recently their genomes were uh, determined and sequenced. And what we found was that the Fulani, the reason why they can drink milk, is because they've got the European mutation. Was it, was it a chance, chance event? It makes it the same? Nope. We can track that piece of DNA using much of the tools that I talked about earlier. That piece of DNA comes from Northern Europe. And we can say when it came. It's not colonialism that brought it. It arrived about 1,800 years ago. Testament to the fact that sub-Saharan African populations 1,800 years ago were admixing with northern European populations, and that brought that mutation in. Okay. Interestingly enough, it brought that mutation in almost at the beginning of when it arose. So we think that the mutation arose about uh, or started to rise in frequency only about 2,000 years ago in, in European populations. So the history of humanity, as I've said, is migration and mixture. Okay? Any notion of racial purity is simply not borne out by our understanding of genetics. We can see specific population groups do have certain genetic signatures, and those signatures reflect these roots out of Africa about 60,000 years ago around the planet. And each one of those roots would lead to a, a sort of sampling, a subsampling of the genetic diversity that existed originally in Africa. But the key thing about this, the key point that I'll take home message that I want to take you to take from this, is what's happened is that most 
of the genetic diversity that existed at the beginning of humanity. So we arose about 200,000 years ago, somewhere in sub-Saharan Africa. That genetic diversity is essentially what we carried around the world with us. We're gradually adding more, but we're a really young species. We're a young species and we exploded around the world in a way that no mammals have done. So we've taken, because we're such a young species, our genetic diversity is eventually spread through, uh, throughout the world. So it's true, there are differences between certain population groups. You can find signatures of East Asians, earwax. You can find signatures of Europeans. But if you take two Europeans and compare them, you'll find that most of the differences are between those two individual Europeans or between those two Japanese people. Okay? That's where most of the difference lies. So the take-home message, if I want you to have a take-home message, is another metaphor. People talk about the gene pool. In fact, Martin has talked about the gene pool. It's a great metaphor. So if the human gene pool was a real gene pool, though, it would need a warning sign. It's really shallow, so no diving. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Jonathan. Now, as a matter of fact, I did do my GNA, uh, DNA sequencing. I used 23andMe, and apparently I'm not only a one and a half percent Neanderthal, but I also have a low probability of getting bold, so that was <laughs> bloody helpful. It's actually a true story. А, така, преди, преди да излезем отново в почивка, две неща. Първо, предстои една томбола на Мелан, която ще разиграем точно след няколко минути. А, но преди това искам да ви разкажа за едно много интересно събитие, което предстои на 26 ноември. А, правим го заедно с Музейко и този път фокус е върху музиката. Uh, очакват ни близо, мисля, че са точно 6 uh, различни дискусионни лекции и панели, uh, в които ще говорим за различни аспекти на музиката. От това какво е шум, какво е тон, uh, ще се научим как да правим озвучаване, ще говорим за историята на електронната музика, ще имаме workshop, uh, в рамките на който ще може да запишете парче с Иван Шопов. Uh, изобщо така, ще се опитаме да направим нещо наистина, което не е правено до сега и ви съветвам още от сега да си купите билети. Предстои след две седмици а, в Музейко. Формата се нарича Science Night. А, сега за а, томболата на Мелан искам да поканя Василена Вълчанова. Вас си заповядай на сцената, моля. Здравейте. На мен както... По традиция вече се случва няколко пъти, ми се пада удоволствието да раздам тук една много яка награда. Една раница Патагония, която ни е предоставена от Мелан, които са компания за Software Development. Нека видим едно кратко видео с тях. Аз мога да дублирам. ...на хопчиви и можещи хора. Кандидат в на кариер с точка melantech.com Ако си поне наполовина толкова добър програмист, колкото и човек, стани част от екипа на Мелан. Компанията на свежи, находчиви и можещи хора. Кандидат в на кариер с точка melantech.com И така, време е да разиграем тази страхотна раница. Първото нещо, което трябва да направите, е да знаете, че ще трябва да си извадите мобилните устройства от джобовете, така че го направете сега. Томбулата протича последния начин на екрана на мобилното си устройство, след като се логнете в играта на joinmyquiz.com с код 540695. Когато стартираме играта, ще ви се покажат въпроси. Отговаряте на всеки въпрос самостоятелно и ги гледате на екрана си, не както сме правили на предни издания, така че на нашите редовни посетители може да има новост това. Имате общо една минута за отговор на всички пет въпроса и сега ще видим доколко сте слушали в лекциите днес, защото те са свързани с тях естествено. Има някакво сериозно количество хора, които се логват до така степен, че екрана не може да навакса. Добре, добре. Мина 
миналия път мисля, че стигнахме до 300 участници. Сега ще видим дали ще направим рекорд. Wi-Fi не може да ни падне в София Event Center сме. Ето, минахме. Минахме лимита. Мисля, че трябва да го чакам като пуканки. Не знаете, там 3 секунди, ако не се логне някой нов, тогава спираме. Добре. Окей. Аз предвам да започваме. Така, като натиснем бутона старт, виждате на устройствата си въпросите директно и отговаряте един и след друг. Успех! Ние пък междувременно ще виждаме колко верни и колко неверни отговора сме събрали и дали повече от половината хора са слушали достатъчно с наострени уши в залата по време на лекциите. Верни отговори, супер! Не ги мислете твърде дълго, защото резултатите се броят и за това дали отговаряте вярно и това колко бързо отговаряте. Окей, okay, 73% успех е супер. Нека да видим крайните резултати. Въпреки, че те са по-скоро ясни. Сабрина ли каним на сцената, колеги? Сабрина да заповяда. Okay. Oh, you don't speak Bulgarian and you managed to understand what I was saying all the time. That's good. Okay. Final rank number one out of 387. There you go, it's official once this whole thing loads. So, so let's go through the correct answers. На български и на английски аз вече се обърках. Какво са ни дални денисовите хора? Някои не е чак толкова брилянтни неща, но също така и възможността да живеем е на високо. Планетата Уран за кратко се е казвала Джордж, на името на крал Джордж. Ензимът, който прави нацепени мишки е емиостатин. Това, което можем най-ефективно да направим, за да намалим своя карбонов отпечатък е да нямаме деца. И за да сме политически коректни, не казваме неща, които Питър каза на сцена. А ценностите на Мелан са Be smart, be nice и make things happen. 
Okay, so you can officially have this smile for the camera. И е време за почивка.